the 10 points of personal safety. Again, this is one of three types of safety lessons. Personal safety is today. We'll have another one on lab and emergency safety, and then a third one on specific tool and machine safety. Now, in terms of lab environments, they can get much bigger than this. Has anyone ever been in a really big lab that had lots of machines, tools, stuff with power hooked up to it? Yeah, yeah this room has a very light version of that. We have various pieces of equipment in the room that you'll be using over the next few years while you're in school here. And even though the hot wire styrofoam cutter um, and the hot glue gun and scissors are going to be like our main tools that we're going to work with for the, for the design challenge, um, we still have to talk about all different kinds of safety. And today, I'm going to be telling you stories about different experiences I've had with safety or that other people have had where there have been accidents in the past so that we can learn from them and we know how to conduct ourselves when we're in here um, during the project parts of the lab. All right? How about you draw a person on that piece of paper for me? It could be a stick figure. It could be anything you like, but you have 30 seconds. Is that three big? It's up to you. So before we begin, I'll just let you know what your homework assignment will be for tonight. It will be to go home and on a blank sheet of paper, try to remember, without looking at any notes, try to remember what the 10 points of personal safety are that we're going to be going over during this lesson. Everybody got that? So for homework, you're going to be trying your best to remember, without looking at your notes, the 10 points of personal safety. When we go through the different, po the different um, points, we're going to go in an order from head to toe because that way it might make it easier for you to recall that later and remember where each of these items takes place. All right? So I'm going to start off with a story about one of my professors that I had when I was in college. His name was Dr. Rockle. Dr. Rockle was about six foot three, 88 years old. He had a white gray ponytail that came down to here. Um, he had a really high voice like this. And he told the craziest stories all the time. He was our favorite professor. And I had him for a class called Biotechnology. And one day, Dr. Rock was really, really late. And if a college professor is late to class for more than 10 or 15 minutes, students will often say, OK, well, maybe they're not coming in, so they'll get up and leave. Well, Dr. Rock was over half an hour late, but nobody wanted to get up and leave because they loved his stories. Anyway. Um, when Dr. Rockwell finally showed up to the room, he burst in the door and he had these huge black sunglasses on. It was really strange because he, he never wore sunglasses. And he came in, hey everybody, I'm sorry I'm late, take out your notes, we're going to get started now. And he came over to me and he said, hey Chris, can you do me a really big favor? I said, yeah, what do you need? He said, I need you to go out to my truck and find my eyeball. And he pulled the glasses down and he had one regular eyeball. Oh! But the other one was missing. Oh, ew, he was that when he winked, it went like this. Oh, ew, ew. <laughs> when, did you see, when did you see that? It was really strange. I, I don't really remember exactly what it looked like. I just remember how freaked out I was. Because we didn't know that he had had a fake eye or a prosthetic eye. Did he scream? No. In fact, he lost it when he was only nine years old. But in any event, I went out looking for Dr. Rockle's eye. I went out to his truck. I opened up the truck door, and I finally sifted through all these papers and trash, and I come out with this prosthetic eyeball. Has anyone ever seen one before? No. It kind of looks like half of a ping pong ball, and they're made of glass, and they're really expensive because an artist has to blow the glass to make sure that it matches your other eye. Right? In any event, um, Dr. Rockle um, was still standing there teaching the class when I came back in with the eyeball. And I didn't want to like embarrass him or anything, so I tried to be really nonchalant about the whole deal. And I just kind of pointed to the bag and said, Dr. 
Rock, I have your eyeball in here. <laughs> and he goes, oh, everybody, Chris found my eye. Do you want to see me put it back in? <laughs> and everybody was like, no, 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 please don't, please don't. Well, he takes the thing out of the bag. It has some dirt on it. He spits on it. Ow. Wipes it off in the lapel of his suit. Pulls back that winker and pops it back in place. Oh, God. But the problem was that the winker got caught behind the prosthetic eyeball. So it was one, one eye was just sticking out like this. Ew. Everybody's making noises just like that, Matt. And so he said, what's wrong? Is it not straight yet? And he grabs the eyeball again. And he starts pushing it left to right. Er, e, er, e, er, e. Turns out, when Dr. Rockle was just nine years old, he was working in a lab like this, but with, but with even bigger machines. And somebody was working on something on one side of the room, and a piece of material shot across the other side of the room and cut his eye. And instead of going to a medical doctor, Dr. Rockle went out into the woods and picked all these different herbs and tried to make a paste that would help the eyeball heal. It ended up be becoming infected, and he ended up losing his eye. And every time this story comes up, he tells us to make sure that students who are young and start to work in labs like this know how important it is to always pick a pair of safety glasses up as soon as you walk into the lab and put them on and never take them off during lab. Right now is a lesson. It's a little different. So why don't you point to the face on this person and make the first point, which will be always wear safety glasses. Okay, next point. Did you ever see a cartoon where there's like somebody carrying a really long ladder, like a really long ladder, and they're going like this, and their friend calls their name, and they go, what'd you say? And they swing around like this, and the ladder goes, Woof, and the person doesn't see it coming, right? Yeah. What, there's a certain type of vision that we all have. It's the kind of vision that lets, like I can tell there's somebody sitting there with a blue shirt on, even though I'm not looking at them. I couldn't read the shirt if there was something written on it, but I can tell. What, there's a certain vision that like, lets me know what's happening out here on the sides. Do you know, Zach? Out of your eye? Out of the corner of your eyes, the way people say it? There's, there's a medical term for it, too, like a scientific term. Do you know, Daniel? Reflexes? Mm, no. It begins with a P. Matt? Um, in hockey, we always do that, too. And my coach said it's called plus. I think it's called colossal vision. Very close. Peripheral vision. Oh. I'm not sure how you spell it, but I know the word is peripheral vision. If you have a hat on your head, like with the brim out in the front, you kind of block off your peripheral vision on each side. And even though people aren't walking around the room with giant ladders, a hot glue gun can be pretty dangerous, especially if somebody's got a hot glue gun in one hand here, and they just turn around real quick, and the other person isn't looking, and maybe it bumps into their Right, right next to them, you could get burned with the tip of the hot glue gun. So um, eye protection is super important, and so will be rule number two, no hats. No hats. All right, working our way down from head to toe. We're going to get to the third story. And it was about uh, when I was 17 years old. It was my first year in college. And there was a, there was a big lab, like, like uh, twice the size of this, with all these different big machines. And uh, had, there was another friend of mine in class. And his name was John. And John had the most beautiful, long, blonde hair that went like down to here. And he was so proud of it that he was always going like this with it. And one day, he was standing in front of the drill press, drilling holes. And that's that machine there on the end with the blue vise sitting on its table and the red crank on the side, only it was a much larger one. And he was standing in front of it. And somebody called his name and said, hey, John. And he shouldn't be talking to anybody while he's on a machine. That's, that's one of the rules, right? Um, and he says, what? And does a hair flip as he turns to say hello to the person. And 
I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Do you ever ride your bike right after you got your training wheels off and you're pedaling real fast and everything's going fine and then all of a sudden you feel like something's caught and you just come to a complete stop, lock up, and fall over? Has it yeah. happened to you? Yeah. Yes. What is it? My oh. Is it your shoelaces? Yes. Your shoelaces yeah. or your pants get caught in the crank? Yeah. yeah, fast spinny things, like the end of that drill press, don't go well with long stringy things, <laughs> right? Um, he it ended up starting to pull him toward the machine and he screamed really loud and grabbed it and pushed himself away from it and actually ripped a bunch of his hair out. I'm not sure why he didn't, I guess because he was panicking, but he could have just tried to turn it off with that red yellow button right in the front. In any event, when we work with, the, with even the hand drill, long hair being out can be dangerous, it can block your vision as well, it can get dipped into hot glue that's on the table when you're bending over or something. So. The third rule will be tie back long hair. Question? I'm sorry? Yes, he was hurt. Big chunk of it over here. Is he bald? Just in that one spot. But then I think he lost all of his hair anyway once he got to be about 35, so it was unnoticeable. All right, working our way down from head to toe. Um, we get down to the neck area, right? And I'm looking around here to see if anybody would have anything that they would need to take care of if we were, in fact, in lab. Um, same thing with like shoelaces being caught around the, 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 the bike crank. Having anything hanging from your neck can be dangerous. It can get caught on something, it can get pulled into something. Um, if you're leaning over to do something, it could fall down into the paint or the hot glue you're using. We're not in lab right now, this is a lesson, but um, anything hanging from the neck would have to be removed. So we're just going to put the rule as um, nothing hanging from the neck area. Nothing hanging from the neck area. If you ever look closely at many police officers, if they have a tie on, it won't be a real tie, it would be a clip on. That way, if something, somebody couldn't grab that thing, it would just pull right off. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, working our way down. We're going to look around the, the sleeve area here. And this is, I don't have a special story for this one, but I can tell you that many times when I forgot to pay attention to this rule, I've ruined some really nice work shirts that I really liked. Um, if you don't have your sleeves rolled up, you might get the end of your sleeve dipped in anything that's on the table. It could interact or interfere with a tool that we might be using at that time. So in general, we walk in during lab, roll up any long sleeves. We're doing great. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, when it comes to jewelry in the lab, we just mentioned that if you had like really excessive blingage of some kind, that, that would have to be put away. But uh, bracelets, watches, earrings, of course, all these things are fine as long as none of them are dangling from the body. But rings around the fingers is something that we do have to pay attention to. If you have a ring on your finger, and let's say you're walking by the corner of one of these tables that's sticking out and your ring catches on the corner. And it doesn't pull off, it just pulls the finger. You could dislocate your finger. I've seen people that uh, were near a doorway and the door shut and their hand was out and it smushed the ring and started to cut off the circulation to their finger. That can be a little bit scary for somebody. Um, and beyond that, when you do start working with bigger tools and machines as you get into more complicated challenges over the next few years, um, 
rings are dangerous because they can get caught inside of things, right? Has anyone ever had a ring on and got it caught on anything? Just in your daily life? Yeah? Did, did, was it bad? Gotcha. All right, no rings. No rings. This story sounds kind of funny now, but at the time, it was rather scary. It was my first year teaching, and I had a student named John. And John had this big, baggy sweatshirt he loved to wear almost every single day. And it had a big logo on it that said, Johnny Blaze. Okay? And I would always give him a hard time and make him take it off every time he came into the lab because you're not supposed to have any big baggy shirts. This isn't baggy, but if you had like an unbuttoned shirt and pieces could move out in the air as you're walking around, you know, nothing should be, should be dangling from your body like that. So um, at the time, we were in a classroom that was like a metal shop, and we would fabricate things with metal. And maybe you've seen in person or on a TV show before when people are cutting through metal pipes and there's sparks flying all over the place. Maybe? And the student was also stripping paint off of um, another project right next to a student who was doing some cutting. And some of the paint stripper, which is like really flammable stuff, if you even put a, a flame near the vapors, it can light on fire. It had spilled onto the table and he didn't notice it. And his shirt was dipped into that spill. Has anybody ever seen what happens when you take a paper towel and you dip the corner of it into water Don't and it starts to travel up the paper towel? Yeah. It's called wicking, wicking. It's how Under Armour works, actually. It, it wicks moisture away from your body. But um, the real term for that in our bodies is capillary action. In any event, capillary action, wicking, whatever you want to call it, his sweatshirt sucked up all of this flammable substance. And then within minutes, he was working somewhere where he was cutting, and there were these sparks, and his shirt went up in flames. Did he stop, drop, and roll? Actually, I don't know where he was in kindergarten when they learned stop, drop, and roll, but he did scream, yell, and run in a circle, <laughs> which was no good. Um, but in any event, the, um, when, when he had caught on fire like that, it was pretty ironic if you think about the name of his sweatshirt, Johnny Blaze. Kind of like if a fire truck catches on fire. Ir irony, right? So. Um, he's running around in a circle, he's screaming as all this is going down in the, you know, in the time of like a half a second. And luckily, a girl that was sitting near him remembered our lesson about lab safety, which you'll do later. She pulled the emergency fire blanket from off the wall. It's just a, a regular blanket, but it's soaked in a certain chemical that keeps it fire retardants. And she wrapped him up in it. And when, when they got the flames out, the shirt wasn't even messed up because it was the, the, the volatile chemical that was burning. And that has to burn off before it'll start to catch the shirt on fire. All that went down so quick. So he was very lucky. I was very lucky. Everybody was very lucky that day. So I don't know. This was like 14 years ago. So yeah. Let's put another rule. Um, no baggy shirts. Okay. Or we could just say top shirts, whatever you'd like to call it. And by the way, if you want to practice writing in all capital letters, we'll be doing that anyway for the sketching and drawing lessons. I know somebody was asking me about it yesterday, why I don't use lowercase. Because it gets really sloppy. All right, working our way down. We have two or three more. We get to the feet area. Um, back to the whole idea of riding the bike, right? If you have shoelaces that are untied, that's going to be dangerous, but in a lab it's dangerous too because you could step on one of the shoelaces and trip. And that trip could be just enough to knock you into somebody who's in a safe zone with three feet of area around them with nobody in it. They're minding their business and then somebody trips into them and then they bump into the machine that they're working on. Like, it, like dominoes, right? Domino. Tie your shoes. We're doing wonderful. 
You're going to remember these pretty easily, I think. Yes. And when you do your homework assignment, you don't have to cheat or look at anything. You really should test yourself. It's good to try to commit things to memory. All right. Last one down by the feet. One day in my old classroom, it had just become really nice and sunny outside. It was spring. We opened the big, huge back door that was in the back of the lab. It was so big. It was like one of those bay doors that a big tractor trailer could back up to to make deliveries. And a lot of students that day had worn shorts to school, and girls were wearing their sundresses. And they were sitting by the back door talking right at the end of the period uh, toward the end of cleanup. When cleanup is called, all work has to stop, no matter what you're doing. That's why I'm watching some of you when I, when I say, caps on the markers, and people keep working. That makes me wonder, would you still keep working during cleanup time? Uh, well, this one student was still working. He had a mallet that was five times the size of this, and he was banging away at something over here on the, t on the table, all the way across the room. And out of nowhere, it slides out of his hand. The mallet goes across the room. <laughs> These girls were standing over here by the door, and whoa, poof, on her foot. You know, not the little toe on the end, but the one right next to it? Nail, pop right off. <laughs> she picks it up. <sighs> what am I going to do? I'm sorry. It's going to look really funny for probably the next nine months. Has anybody here ever had a nail fall off or get like a big bruise underneath the, the nail? And when it finally falls off, it looks real funky as it grows back for months. Yeah. yeah. What could she have done to have avoided that injury? Ethan. She could have been paying attention. She could have been paying attention, but she shouldn't have had to be paying attention to the whole room because it was cleanup time. Nobody should be working. But what do you think down here, Ethan? Oh, wear protective shoes. Yes. No open-toed shoes or sandals. We'll say it like that. No open-toed shoes or sandals. Sure. All right. The tenth rule. The tenth rule. Uh, also, early in my career, I had a student. This student's name was John. He was really big, super nice guy. Every single day he came into the lab, it didn't matter what was going on in his world, he'd always walk into class like this. How's it going? How's it going? So I definitely knew something was wrong when he walked into the room one day. looking at me like this. I said, John, are you okay? And he says, I'm fine. And I said, what happened? What's going on? Nothing. I just want to get to work. And I said, okay. And he went to work over on this machine called a bandsaw. And a couple seconds later, I realized that he was standing right behind me. And I said, I said what's wrong? He said, he, said, he said, something's wrong with the bandsaw. It's not broken, but it's going to need to be cleaned. And I said, what the heck? He was pale. He was probably in shock. And when he picked up his hand to show me his hand, he had cut all the way through from here to here. It was probably the worst accident I've ever seen live. His thumb went like this. And he was just calm? He ended up with like 60 stitches. And even when we called the, the hospital, and said, can we get an ambulance? They said, it doesn't sound life-threatening. You can just get him in a car and drive him over here. What? Yeah. And it turns out what had happened was the night, because who's going to cut through their whole hand? You'd have to come to class and say, all right, everybody, today I'm going to cut through my whole hand. Oh. All right, we're going to stand right in front of the saw here. If I pass out from the pain, just push. <laughs> Three, two, do we go on one or two? Just push. <laughs> ah! <laughs> That would never happen. If you touch a hot stove, right, as soon as you touch, whoa, something must have been going on. Well, I found out right before he walked into class, he was told that his girlfriend had cheated on him. And it was his first girlfriend. So during the lab, even though he was working at the machine, his mind was somewhere else. And that was kind of a negative story. You could be going to Disney World tomorrow. I'm going. And you are so excited about Disney World, 
you got pictures of Donald Duck all over your room, and all you could picture while you're in school today is you and Donald Duck walking around the Magic Kingdom, getting pictures together in front of the fountain. You're going to get it signed, put it above your bed. If you're distracted in a really good way, maybe you would think about not working that day or setting yourself aside from things where you're not going to be focused and concentrated. So the number 10 rule will be stay focused and have a positive attitude. Just in time for one more story. This one's kind of a bonus. Mm. When I was um, seven years old, my little brother, five years my younger, uh, you should see him now. He's got long hair down to here. He's like an incredible shape. He's a long distance runner. He went to West Point. He graduated or came out of the military as a, what was it, a, a captain. He was a captain. He'd been to Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, but we're going all the way back to the time when he was two years old and he was just a little baby who could barely walk and was still wearing diapers. Oh. My dad had just cut a big tree down and it was out front and there was a bunch of logs. And my dad was, a, was out, my mom was in the house, my brother was out front playing, and I'm sitting there looking at these logs. I know I was only seven years old, but I'm looking at the logs and I'm thinking, that could be a coat rack for my parents' foyer. <laughs> So I decided I'd get to work on this woodworking project. I went out and I grabbed this brand new, really sharp axe, and I started to hack off the bark. Because I gotta get the bark off if I'm gonna sand it and then stain it. What color am I gonna stain it? I don't know, it's my own design. It's pretty cool, I can do anything I want. So I'm getting really into this, and I'm chopping the wood, and I'm thinking, and my brother keeps walking over. Oh, oh, like this. And just as I was chopping, the bark's flying everywhere, these kids come down the street on these brand new bicycles, and one of them was doing a wheelie. He was like nine years old, and I could, couldn't wait to figure out how to do a wheelie. And I was distracted, and I swung the axe one more time, and then I saw this thing fly out across my field of vision into my periphery. What was that? That didn't look like bark. My brother looks at me. He looks over there at that thing on the ground. He looks at me, and he looks at his hand. <laughs> screaming at the top of his lungs. He never took a breath. He just kept going. And I got scared, so I pretended it didn't happen. And I went back over and I kept chopping wood. And just then my mom comes outside of the house. What happened out here? What are you doing? I dropped the axe and I started to run. My mom picks up the axe. She's running around in the circle, running around in the yard after me. We're going in circles and my brother's right in the middle like this. It was so loud, my neighbor, Mr. Ely, came outside of his house. What's going on, everybody? Everybody stop. Me and my mom stopped. My brother's in the middle going, ah! <laughs> we get in the car. My mom says to me, go over there and do something with that finger. We got to go to the hospital. So I went over and I picked up the finger. I brought it into the house. It was like a little warm sausage. I could still move pieces of it around. I, then I poured a glass of milk. I threw it in the milk. Yeah, that's what you're supposed to do with a... You're not. <laughs> That's a tooth that falls out, isn't it? Yeah, I confused my health lessons that morning. <laughs> Turns out if a tooth gets knocked out, you put that in a glass of milk. No, no. An appendage would go into a bag of ice to keep it cool, which sounds bizarre, but it makes sense because when you buy meat at the grocery store, you want to keep it fresh, you put it in the fridge, right? So I run back outside, I bring out the glass of milk, I hand it to my mom. What are you giving me a glass of milk for? I'm not thirsty right now. <laughs> and I said, no, the fingers are there. And she said, what? You gonna put the finger in here? You put it in a bag of ice? What are you doing? I run back in the house. I dump the glass of milk out. There goes the finger. Plop. I pick it up. Now it's like really white and gray and it's like uh, stiff. I can't even bend it anymore. That's no fun. Put it in the bag of ice. We get, to, we get back in the car on our way to the hospital. My brother's just giving me one of these in the back seat. Hand all wrapped up in paper towels. Ah! in my ear. So I go, I take his head and I roll the window down just enough to get his head out of it and I roll the window back up. Perfect siren. All people could hear from the side of the road was Aah! 
cars were pulling over for us. They thought there was an ambulance behind them. So we finally get, we finally get off. We finally get to the hospital. My mom sends me in. I bust through the doors, and all these nurses are, are standing there going, can we help you? What's wrong? I said, my brother will be right in. He has a scratch on his finger. She said, here, fill out this insurance paperwork. And, um, you know, and I'm seven years old. I, don't, I can't even write in cursive yet. So I sit down, and I start to draw my coat rack. <laughs> Just then, my mom comes through with my brother. Perfect timing. He's hanging from her arm. Ah! She's holding him. They go back. They come out an hour later from the emergency room. Finger reattached. A little bit crooked, but they got it mostly right. Turns out, because the ax was so sharp and he was so young, the cut was such a clean cut, as opposed to being like a jagged cut, that they could wrap leeches around the finger where it was detached. And the leeches would get the blood flowing again back through those parts of the finger. And I think, I think he learned a very valuable lesson that day. Right, don't, don't go near people with axes. Um, no, but actually, I did want to point that part out about when someone does get a cut. In fact, we've seen people have their whole arms attached, reattached now. Especially if they're younger or if they're, if they're older and they're in really good shape. I hope you enjoy these stories today. The stories may be gross, but they're important. Hold on. Hands free, eyes on me. They're important because they're memorable. And we can learn from the different mistakes that I made and that other people made in some of these stories. Of course, many of these stories took place in environments that were more complicated than this with more tools and machines. But like I said, even a hot glue gun can be dangerous in this setting. Nice job with the 10 points of personal safety.